So good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sally Charno and along with my colleague, um, Judy Coffin, we're delighted to welcome you to today's French Press New Books on Francophone History. Today we're focusing on Rachel Angelette's new book, At Home in Our Sounds, Music, Race and Cultural Politics in Interwar Paris. Um, but before we get there, actually, I want to say a few words about the Society for French Historical Studies. As many of you know, we offer a wide variety of programming in support of the history of France and the Francophone world. From online discussions such as this one, French Press, to virtual and in-person conferences, from small gatherings to very large meetings, from more focused and thematic conversations to more free-flowing exchanges of ideas, the Society is committed to promoting our scholarly community. And before moving on to our dis exciting discussion today, um, I wanted to just take a moment um, to invite you to our upcoming in-person annual conference in Charlotte, North Carolina. This long-awaited meeting will take place uh, between the 24th and 26th of March, 2022, and we hope that you'll be able to make it whether you're on the program or not. Being together after so much time and such a difficult time uh, will be fun and rewarding. So I'm gonna put the conference information in, and the website um, in the chat right now. And with that, we'll move on to today's French press. Um, Unlike our previous sessions today, Professor Gillette will be in conversation with two colleagues, Dr. Kesselwa John, Associate Lecturer in Caribbean History at University College London, and Dr. Jonathan Briggs, Professor of History and Associate Dean of Humanities and the Arts at Indiana University Northwest. And just to remind you, on February 6th at 3 p.m., we will welcome Nina Gelbart, and uh, we'll be discussing her book, Minerva's French Sisters, Women of Science in Enlightenment France. And she will be in conversation with Kathleen Wellman from Southern Methodist University. Many of you know we postponed that session from December in order to remember our colleague and friend, Tyler Stovall. So just a few housekeeping notes. Um, as you no doubt noticed, for security reasons, we've kept your videos off and have muted everyone except the speakers and disabled the chat. When the discussion opens up for Q&A, the chat will be available for your questions and we ask you to send them to Jonathan uh, and just to Jonathan so he can organize them. So to begin, Rachel Angelette is an assistant professor of cultural history and, and art history at Utrecht University. Her articles have appeared in First World War Studies, a journal, the American Historical Review, and the Rutledge Handbook of Francophone Africa, and the Musicking, which is such a great word, Musicking in 20th Century Europe, among others. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Rachel. Well, um Yes, and you introduced Kesawa and Jonathan as well. And I wanted to say uh, that I, it was really important to me to have both of them here today. Um, they've both been on this journey with me for a little bit of time. And um, Jonathan's expertise in music, uh, in jazz, and in French music and sound and national identity is unparalleled. And so I'm really excited to have him here from that perspective. And Kesawa and I have many friends in common among the Nardal sisters and among the people who study them among French anti-colonial networks uh, and the French Caribbean. Uh, and I uh, also really thought it was important to have a gender balance and an experiential balance. And um, so it was important to have both of them here to actually reflect the book and my journey with it. Uh, which brings us to the book, and I'm allowed to speak, uh, I get to speak, so exciting, um, for, for a little while, uh, about 15 minutes. Uh, and I just have to say, I'm so honored to be here. Uh, I'm surrounded by people, I saw you all come in and my heart just leapt, uh, surrounded by people I respect. Um, many of you I'm a little in awe of, more than a little in awe of. 
Uh, and uh, you represent a collective that has provided a sense of a scholarly home for me um, from my first conferences with the Western, uh, the Western Society for French History, the Society for French Historical Studies, and the French Colonial. So I'm really glad. And before I talk a bit about the book, I want to dedicate this session to Tyler Stovall, whose work in Paris Noir inspired mine and quite literally created the subfields within which my work sits. Black Paris, Black Francophone Atlantic, uh, and Tyler, of course, um, worked with and inspired amazing scholars like Trisha Deneen Sharpley Whiting, Emily Church, Jennifer Boitin, and, and so many who worked alongside each other on the people and processes that inhabit the book. Um, so <laughs> what is the book about? Well, it is about Black Americans and Black French colonial citizens and subjects in Paris in between the two world wars about how jazz brought them together and how music became a site of culture, of politics, of identification, uh, of exploration, uh, and how uh, they experienced all of this. Uh, and the book takes us through those experiences and what they meant uh, for Black diasporic community in Paris. Um, so as prompted by Sally and Judy, who've been so gracious in hosting me, I'll now go over some of the book's main arguments and its thematic interventions. Um, a little bit about the chapters, uh, and most importantly, introduce you to a few of the voices in the book. And uh, as I do this, I'm going to just share a couple of images uh, which might help locate us. Uh, I'm going to share the sound as well, um, and because some sense of sound in your ears. So the book opens, actually, uh, and here you see the cover and a little blurb about it. Um, and uh, the book opens with an anecdote about Wally Kane, but his actual name is Jazz Williams, he says. Uh, and the anecdote shows a journalist interviewing Jazz Williams in Marseille. Uh, and uh, the interviewer says, hey, but you know, I knew you when you were Alphonse in the French Catholic Mission School back in Senegal. So why are you now Jazz Williams? And the musician says, well, you know, uh, Wally Kane, Alphonse, nobody recognized me. I came to France during the war. After the war, I wanted to stay here, get a job here. What did I get? Washing up dishes in a restaurant, down in the sewers like a rat. But when I put on an American name and played the drums, then I made money. Then people respected me. And the book compares his experience, actually, and places it in contrast with um, that of an American band leader, so the book opens, and with that of Paulette Nadal, who walks into a French colonial ball, Val de la Glacière, and is surrounded by uh, black diasporic men and women dancing. And she says, in this great room, in this Belle Coloniale, I felt at home. And that really stuck out to me and actually inspired the name of the book. And as you can hear from that anecdote, the book has three kind of persistent themes and main findings, which I think are also methodological and maybe conceptual interventions. And the first is the persistent expression of solidarity and difference, or even solidarity in difference among a range of communities and groups uh, of people in interwar Paris, all of whom identified as black. And they felt solidarity with each other on the basis of that racialized identification. And they did that even as they acknowledged the differences between them. Uh, and I use a range of terms throughout the book, black, black French, Antillean, black American, to describe those communities. And those terms reflect sets and subsets, networks, very fashionable term nowadays, uh, of people who lived in Paris, but also who moved and belonged in communities around the Atlantic, uh, and who sometimes did act in solidarity and felt connected through the experience of racialization and structured exclusion or partial inclusion. 
but who at times differed greatly, and they really expressed those differences actively. Uh, and African colonial subjects were more often radically anti-colonial and wanted to end empire. French Antillean citizens of color did it. Many of them wanted recognition and inclusion in official and societal understandings of who and what counted as French, the right to be black and French. Um, and the acknowledgement that black French were an inherent part of the Republic, even when imagined not of it. So that work, uh, that sort of analysis of solidarity indifference fits in with work in diaspora studies and black studies, but also histories of France and histories of the French Empire. Um, and I think the oscillation, movement back and forth between solidarity and difference also uh, is part of the book. Second theme, and I suspect we'll talk about this today, and it's pretty obvious, uh, and intervention undergirds my methodological claim, um, or sorry, is my methodological claim. I treat music making as a vital source base, and one that is often underutilized by historians. And this ties in with the theme of cultural culture, that we make and sustain political claims in cultural ways and that our cultural practices shape policy, politics, econom economy, society, and governance. Even though culture is sometimes sectioned off as sort of floating beneficently above or below the socio-political realm. Um, and a third theme, and I won't emphasize this as much or talk as much about it, but is that music making and listening and dancing and sharing Music King uh, facilitated an outward looking, mobile, and yet race or racialization conscious form of cosmopolitan. Uh, ask me a little bit about that if, if you. Um, so I'm still sharing my PowerPoint, I think, and I can see Kesawa and Jonathan's face. They're nodding vigorously at me. And I think if I press play, you will now hear some some of the music that inhabits the book. So I will also look to Kesawa and Jonathan to nod if this works. Bella begin. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think that's so important just to have a sense of that. I'm going to stop sharing in a second so I can try and communicate a little bit also with my face and voice. But I'll just um, leave you with these two images uh, as I um, move into some more details. Uh, I would like you to have also this image in your eyes, quite a striking one. I can put it back on again if you want. It's uh, a poster called L'Invasion Noir, uh, and you can see there the skyscrapers, uh, the figures of uh, black entertainers dancing, and here, uh, Josephine Baker, or a Josephine Baker lookalike with flesh-colored stockings that she has donned as though in disguise or some kind of exotic hybrid fusion. Uh, and um, this is an image that captures some of the ambivalence uh, that I also discuss in the book. Uh, and then another image that I think captures so much of what I discuss in the book. And here are these wonderful women uh, celebrating the tercentenary of uh, France's settlement of the Antilles. 
Uh, and they are doing so in this lavish festival at the Bal des Antilles at the Paris Opera, sitting there in their uh, Caribbean dress, in their headscarves, at the amazing uh, gilded chandelier lit uh, Bal de Paris. Um, and so I really wanted to share some of that sound and image with you uh, before I returned to <laughs> talking um, about things. So when I put the music on, uh, I wanted to emphasize the fact that this music became a site of identification and affiliation. Uh, and I'll just read a short quote from the book that uh, finishes a, a close reading an analysis of that piece that we just heard, which has the piano of American jazz with the clarinet, the sinuous, uh, elastic clarinet of the begin. Uh, and uh, I say, I write, the commercially successful should begin, thus takes us into the heart of the music that became a site on which black French, particularly Antilleans, explored their cultural identity and their relationship with Frenchness. They took pride in the music of their homeland. They used it to raise money for political causes. And they used it to show one could be both black and French, which challenged unspoken assumptions about French citizenship and belonging. That challenge was political. Uh, and so these themes uh, animate the book. And the narrative of moments of solidarity contrasting with moments of difference uh, and being able to trace that through musical practices helps structure the chapter as well and the chapters in relation to each other. I say that although I also went with chronology because we're historians and chronology is helpful sometimes. So the first chapter uh, is uh, called The Flip Side of Jazz. Well, the introduction is called Setting Up, and it does indeed set the scene and introduce the different uh, groups that I talk about. But the first chapter uh, does start with the infamous moment in Paris when Josephine Baker arrives, but actually a little bit before that when the band The Harlem Hellfighter arrives. But it's entitled The Flip Side of Jazz. And what I wanted to do in that chapter was build on the work of Tyler Stovall, build on the work of Brett Berliner uh, and various others who had written um, particularly early in the study of um, jazz and interwar Paris, who wrote a lot about the white reactions. And one of the things I really wanted to do in the book was think about how black French colonial subjects and citizens reacted to jazz. And so I plunge right into some of their reactions, one of which is the great ambivalence with which they greet jazz and Josephine Baker. There is this sense that uh, the visibility of black culture has been raised to an all-time high, and this is wonderful. Uh, you know, the jazz musicians are making black culture front and center. And yet, if they are doing so in images such as the one you saw in L'Invasion Noire, very telling title to that poster, then is this exactly what we want as, as fledgling, uh, as emerging black French humanist networks? Uh, and many of you will be familiar with uh, Jane Nadal's famous takedown, I would say, of Josephine Baker, in which she says, uh, you know, she's bringing modernity and the black primitive together. This is great, but we black French need to do better. We need to bring a black French humanist uh, aesthetic into Paris and, and, and create our own cultural um, products. The second chapter turns to a little bit to the black American presence and digs into this very convenient um, cultural political claim that France is colorblind, with which black Americans built up a narrative that judged America and uh, that gave uh, black Americans, and they wrote back to this all the time in newspapers, France loves her colored peoples. There is no color bar in France. Uh, and so the ch second chapter looks at this as a form of mobility and freedom, but one that has constraints. And it actually then contrasts uh, black French Caribbean um, kind of experiences of Paris, some of which were the same. Drinks, yes. Money, yes. 
Visible success, yes. Limits, yes. Um, the third, and that actually begins to get into the depression and the economic consequences of that, and, and suggests that actually a, a form of solidarity emerged as musicians as times got tighter, and musicians all experienced some of the same hardships. The third chapter turns to the colonial exposition and looks at the very literal performance in dance and music of racialization and racial hierarchies there. Um, and uh, it ends with how much the, the Antillean pavilion is adored by the French. This is nostalgia, this is theme serving us rum and cocoa and making us feel as though she's far from home and yet at home in France. And Hasn't France been amazing to these French Caribbeans? Um, and so that chapter sort of looks at racialization and hierarchy as performed at the colonial exposition, but also how uh, anti-colonial networks mounted an anti-exposition and also addressed music and performance in it. It also tries to look at the experience of some of the performers at the exposition and how they formed impressions of Paris and France and empire through their experience of moving into the metropolis and out again. The fourth chapter digs deeper into the Beguin, uh, the musical form that I spend so much time with, I spent so many hours listening, and that various commentators, French Caribbean commentators, proclaimed was the soul of the Antilles, that Paulette Nadal, André Nadal, Jane Nadal, danced and wrote about with passion um, in, in wonderful phrases like, how could you compare the Beguine, which is the graceful glide across the ball, ball to the frenetic shimmying of the Charleston? <laughs> and, you know, how can you compare these American band leaders with their tricks to our gentlemanly stelio conducting the orchestra like a, 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 a gentleman? Um, so, and it also looks at the fundraising balls and the way that the police stamped down hard on them. And then the fifth chapter, uh, which I actually loved uh, writing uh, and really uh, sort of came together quite late in the piece, uh, was um, it compares the tercentenary, tercentenary of the Antilles uh, with the invasion of Ethiopia by Mussolini. Uh, and the tercentenary of the Antilles, you saw the picture earlier, um, was very controversial uh, among French anti-colonial circles, among French diasporic circles. Some people really did celebrate it, saw it as a chance to show off black uh, French Caribbean culture. Others denigrated it, and this is ridiculous. Why are we celebrating the occupation of um, so that's the fifth chapter, and then the conclusion looks a little bit at the kind of political and cultural outcomes of this period. And I think that's really uh, all I wanted to say about the book, uh, except that I thought I might leave you with two final quotations. Uh, so you're going to have to bear with me while I read to you, uh, very short, about two minutes, um, from the book, uh, page 16 of the introduction. Most of us live of the prelude. Um, most of us live with a complicated set of national and personal affiliations. Yet textbooks and official history of the type that becomes part of the French national and nationalist rhetoric can flatten and elide that story into, a set, into intersecting sets of binaries, French or not, good or bad colonial subjects, educated or ignorant, unquestioningly loyal or resistant. The truth was and is much more complex, just like music. Love for the jaunty, swirling rhythms of the Beguine existed in tension and in harmony with French culture, the culture of Diderot and d'Alembert, of Molière, Rameau, Beaumarchais, Lully, and the evanescent floating strains of Debussy. France is, to paraphrase Jennifer Boitin, a post-colonial metropolis, or, to borrow from Gary Wilder, an ex-imperial nation-state. 
Music springs those truths on us at a sensory level that can be lost or glossed over in text, bringing the music lover Paulette Nardal into focus in her middle-class, anti-Ian, intellectual, loyal, and yet critical and at times angry reality can help us acknowledge how these complicated and multiply cons constituted identities have shaped France to this day. The celebrated film La Haine, with its musical backdrop of French hip hop, was one legacy of the Antilleans and Africans whirling around the dance floor at the Bal Colonial. Thank you so much for your time and your patience as I went over some bits of the book. Thank you so much, Rachel, for, uh, for giving us a, a very kind of a flavor, at least, of, of some of the text. Um, and I certainly want to congratulate you on the success of the, of the book itself. Uh, thinking back to when we both started our projects, it's wonderful to see um, these things come to conclusion. So, uh, and of course, with that in mind, uh, one of the first things that I wanted to, to ask you, maybe if you could, could ruminate on, um, is your own relationship with music. Um, I think we've talked about this much uh, in passing as well, and how that maybe impacted the direction of your book. I think one of the, the more successful elements of the book is how music doesn't exist in the sort of vacuum, but is certainly a part of uh, not only a sort of critical voice, uh, but is also about uh, this performance, it's about dancing, it's about uh, the spaces performance and I, I do want to talk about that perhaps more later but I think I just want to hear your thoughts about how you have uh, been informed by your own experiences with music in your sort of scholarly approach here. That's a wonderful question <laughs> thank you and um, actually I was listening to Namisha Barton about her book Reproductive Citizens and she said there was this moment after writing it when she realized how much of her personal history had gone into it, even though it, it, it's not a book in which she talks about that necessarily. But I am a singer, uh, and uh, I grew up singing, and I've always sung in choirs, uh, which is uh, a community in and of itself. It is a, a community often that actually transcends age, sometimes class, not always racialization. Um, particularly the choirs that I sing in, which tend to be very classical choral music. I sing very different music from the music that I study. But um, I also grew up in New Zealand, and uh, New Zealand and Oxford, two very different music traditions. Uh, and they, I know how they sound different. And in New Zealand, I was very lucky to sing with the National Youth Choir, and we trained with Maori performance groups. And uh, you can't sing Maori music at this stage in New Zealand history without training and learning and knowing with the, about the significance, the music, about it, how it lives. It, it lives in community, uh, the, the honor you bring it and it brings you when you sing it, which sounds a very spiritual way of, of thinking and talking about music. Um, but I think being a singer, being a choir singer, where you literally breathe with other people, right? You are literally phrasing together with other people. I do have a sense of the physicality of it. I do have a sense of some of the community stuff that goes with it. Um, it also happens to be a skill I have. It's a language. So when it came to writing the book, it, it is a source base that I think I quite well equipped to deal with. Um, and then the only other thing I'd say about that is I have moved a lot. I've lived in New Zealand, in England, in France, in America, and it's lonely moving country. And so I've always joined a choir as soon as I could. <laughs> and uh, I've sung in churches, in, in the basements in Paris, for example. And um, I think that actually I, do, I didn't reflect very consciously on it in the PhD in terms of how I understand some of this stuff, I did when I was writing the book, and it was a long trajectory from PhD to book. <laughs> and, but I think some of that trajectory helped give me a, a little bit of maturity. That sounds very arrogant, but a little bit of maturity on or reflection on how music operates. And also at conferences, people would say, you know, have you thought about space? Have you thought about movement? Um, but thanks, I could say more, but I think that's enough. 
Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, Rachel, um, I, I would add to that that your love for music really comes from the book as well, that you're not just a singer, but you really love music. And I, I, I'm absolutely not a trained singer like you, but, um, but I really enjoyed the way that you evoked the feeling and the emotion that, mo that, mo that, that music brings. Um, yeah, just to circle back to the beginning of that question and then go in a different direction. Um, one of the other things um, that I was kind of curious about was your use of language, actually. I hope this isn't too technical a question, but Antilles and Afro-Caribbean and French-Caribbean, they're all terms that you use somewhat interchangeably in the book, I felt like, but I wondered if that's how you feel. Um, and are you using them because at different points you're expressing different identities that are, that's changed a little bit or something else? This is a great question. Um, I think you said Antillean, <laughs> Afro-Caribbean and French-Caribbean, and they are all slightly different actually. Um, and I think sometimes when I said Afro-Caribbean, which is an interesting and difficult term, I was trying to draw attention to the fact that the person I was talking about was a person of color, and that mattered with regard to what they were saying. Um, but, but so sometimes it was pretty conscious. At other times, this is a group of people I talk about a lot, and you just have to vary the prose sometimes a little bit. And sometimes it was also that... Uh, I was, I'm really source driven. And so I was reflecting sometimes the language that I saw in the source base. So, um, Paulette Nadal, they, they would use the word Antilles, uh, Antilles and Antillean a lot. And I think maybe subconsciously that also affected when I used which term. I struggle much harder with black French, actually, and I still do. And, um, but it also captured a reality. So with regard to the, the Afro-Caribbean groups, the diasporic Caribbean groups in France that I talk about, um, I think it was just a little bit of trying to vary it. But with regard to the other groups, as I said, I mean, the, I, I even use the race in a couple of places, and that came through the sources that I was using to reflect some of the ways that people at the time were thinking about themselves yeah in relation to the the experiences they were having with race with racialization yeah it's a tough one um this had carrying people describe themselves in different contexts um so i was really interested in how you chose them to thank you so rachel i want to return back to um to space since you since you mentioned space right so um, I think it's one of the really fascinating sort of threads that you're able to develop is this, this sort of ambivalence slash uh, critique of uh, Josephine Becker and like her present success uh, and performativity, right? And I think in kind of all of the examples that you, that, that you discuss in the book, there is this uh, relationship, if you will, this connection between the specific spaces in which these artists uh, perform uh, and interact with audiences and the types of audiences that they interact with, right? Um, and there's this, there's, I think what you're, you're, you're really kind of uh, illuminating here is this connection between. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that, like these, these vast arrays of differences in spaces that uh, germinated sort of the success of jazz, uh, the Beguine, et cetera, et cetera. Unmusing myself, but um, amusing my video. Okay, yeah, that's I fantastic. I love the adventure of it though. <laughs> Surprise. Um, no, that's a, a fantastic question. And actually uh, I would love everybody also to read um, Jennifer Boitin's book, probably many of you have, because she does space, par excellence, um, you know, and, uh, but with regard to music, there are some very clear spaces here and, and quite physical, literal spaces. So uh, I talk a lot, well, I, I um, write about Bricktop, who's a, a flamboyant, red-headed nightclub owner who has a nightclub up in Montmartre, Montmartre is where the rich white Parisians went to listen to black French jazz musicians, right? 
the Bal de la Glaciere that Paulette Nardal writes a review of and says, I felt at home in my skin here. Reputedly, you had to have a, a, um, a foyer colonial ticket to get in. So they were specifically trying to get away from the, what would you call them, the Harlem slummers in, in America, <laughs> but the, the elite white French who were populating many of the cabarets up in Montmartre and who had started going to the Balbulier uh, to see and participate in these, um, in, in black music and black dance. Um, so uh, in that way, space functioned um and and uh the brick tops nightclub there is she, her her memoir is very explicit about this it was open for wealthy white clients the black musicians were the entertainers there was that power relationship there it was nevertheless very useful to black entertainers brick tops served as a home base for them she received their letters she would pull them in from America. <laughs> she reportedly gave Max and Hughes a job as a dishwasher when he couldn't get work in Paris and was trying to do his poems, right? And Bricktop was like, look, wash dishes. I'll give you some money. It's going to be okay. And, um, but, it, but she was very clear that her wealthy white clients were not her friends and would never be, she would never marry any of them, for example. She, she has this amazing line, I, I can tell you that they're okay lovers, but would I marry them? No, I would only ever be a backstreet mistress to them. Um, and so as always, I go to my sources to, to answer your question, Jonathan, because uh, these spaces were distinct and there was a sense of home sometimes in the spaces where some of these black diasporic groups could be together without feeling, Paulette Nadal, without feeling the violent intrusion of a European gaze upon you, I think is one of the quotes that, that uh, I, I use in my book. Um, and there were parts of the city that when you look through the police surveillance records, they say, oh, these areas were subject to periodic hygiene sweeps and still are to this day. And uh, so that's the 18th, and that's where the anti-colonial network has their office. Um, but it's a different part of the 18th than Montmartre, where the wealthy white clubs are, or than the Champs-Élysées, where Josephine Baker performed. And Josephine Baker is performing on these cabaret stages, again, to big audiences for big bucks, tries to open her own nightclub, very elite. So. There are many different spaces. They are absolutely laden uh, with socioeconomic divisions, with regional divisions. And you even see that um, not just in the spaces, but in the factionalism of the anti-colonial networks where the French group, and actually the Nadal Salon, they have educated elite, what were called at the time, évolué, coming to visit their home. They're really different from the dishwashers and the taxi drivers and the people who, who then go and work in the factories, um, some of whom Tyler writes about actually in one of his, his articles, um, who are beyond the periphery. Um, so these spaces are really differentiated, even apart from racialization. And yeah, I've, I've said enough. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. And still so much interesting in there. Um, Yes, so would, you, would you like to uh, follow yeah. up? Yeah, I'll jump in with another question. Um, I, I will say um, one of the things I really enjoyed about the book actually was how you draw these very clear kind of pictures of these different class divisions that we don't always hear about when we hear about black French communities um, in Paris. And um, I thought you did that really well just to stop talking about the things that I loved and to get on with the question. Um, <laughs> so women. Uh, I think you do a fantastic job of, of centering them throughout the text. Um, and you really, um, particularly in the context of music, uh, we don't often think of, we don't, we often hear about music, um, women in music as singers, um, and, and, and very rarely as kind of thinkers about music, but you describe, you, you, you give us plenty of opportunities to hear the voices of these Caribbean women talking about the music that they love so much. Um, and <laughs> And so I was sort of complaining a lot about American music, which they also love a little bit as well. It's, it's quite confusing their position sometimes. But um, I just wondered if, 
if this is focus on black women um, in interwar France, it's it's not always done. Often, uh, historically, we've seen a lot of of of, of treatments of the subject which is focused on black men and often white women. Um, how easy was it for you to kind of draw that draw black women into the center of your of your narrative, really? Um, and why was it important? It was important because they were there, because they were writing, because they had opinions, because they were shaping the cultural politics and the intellectual climate that I wrote about. And, you know, Emily Church, Emily Musel Church did begin to show this. And actually Brent Hayes Edwards and Jennifer Boitin, but in Brent Hayes Edwards' book, you know, the, 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 it's a little bit peripheral. And Jennifer brings these voices out more and to me, I also wanted to not to have to write about it like it was this super special thing that I did, right? But just to make it a given, right? These women are here. Their voices are here. And it would be wrong not to include them. Like, and how can you write this without including them? You know, so um, I think uh, as, uh, so that was important to me. I did go looking for them. I wanted to start this project. I was inspired when I first began my PhD by actually the Black American Blues and the Blues Queens of the 1920s. And so then when I discovered Josephine Baker's story, I wanted to figure out how Black American women experienced Paris. And so from the get-go, I was sort of looking for women's voices. And then there was this moment at the um, Ben F. Tolby Act, you know, the big space, and you think you're never going to find anything. And, and it's so daunting and then I got the microfiche and I saw Pantin Exotique which is now this very famous uh, letter by Jane Nardal about Josephine Baker and honestly my jaw dropped over I got chills and I hand transcribed it and translated it on the spot and it took me half a day but I think that was what really put me on the trail of the Nardal sisters and you cannot understand the Nadal sisters and begin to read their work without seeing how women are woven through this story. I will say I had to work harder at finding people like Leona Ga uh, Gabriel and the composer Mayot Almabi, who composed the begin that I played at the beginning. And her story is amazing because she's this classically trained violinist who then begins to compose begins, which sell like hotcakes. So she makes money and the black French press are like, she's amazing. She's classical violinist. So they're French people. We can do classical. And, um, and then she also sells these really commercially successful begins. And people say, this is wonderful. Our music is now selling and popular because of her. So um, yes, I wanted to center women's voices. I thought it was really important. I did have to work at it. And I'm glad they're in there. And I'm glad you noticed. <laughs> So Rachel, I um, I have a question that really emerges out of the later chapters of the book, and certainly uh, one of the the kind of dynamic chapters is the one that talks about the colonial exposition, and I think that the 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 way you kind of talk about the reactions to participation in uh, the colonial exposition by a number of uh, actors that you've looked at throughout the the text. Um, speaks to this interesting, um, you know, sort of system, framework, ecosystem, if you will, between, you know, popular culture, colonialism, and commerce, right? So certainly one of the things of the colonial exposition was to, you know, sort of show France's benevolence as part of its imperial mission. But of course, another part of it was to make money, right? Uh, and, and, and I think money actually plays this interesting role that you talk about in terms of you know pay who participates uh and their places within it so i wonder if you might also think about um how like the begin and jazz and these sort of things all sort of operate within this framework of commerce and colonialism right this this sort of thing that undergirds the entire system and now it's happening in the metropole as opposed to happening at the periphery Rachel, we can't hear you. We've lost your audio, Rachel. Hey. 
Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, cool. Um, so, Jonathan, in three words, can you summarize that question again? Because I lost you for a moment. Sure. I wondered if you might be able to talk about the relationship that you see between colonialism and commercialism. Yeah. Uh, and not just colonialism and commercialism. I mean, something I sometimes say to students uh, who are talking about hip hop or the blues, and they're like, but it's not authentic because they sold out. I'm like, it's, this is a false binary. <laughs> you know? um, but also, this music sold. This music sold because it appealed to people's sense of the exotic, to people's sense of the primitive, the music did reify certain ideological stereotypes. The colonial exposition was a huge success. There were millions of visitors, uh, and it was definitely putting the racialized representation of people on sale and pretending it was authentic. Um, and so I think there was this very fraught relationship between commercial and very clear relationship between commercialism and colonialism as in every other area, <laughs> you know, um, uh, with music. But I think it's really important to acknowledge that the musicians made money too and that there is a way of being both authentic and making money and using uh, – uh, so much comes back to Josephine Baker, even as I tried to get away from her, the whole book. But, <laughs> you know, she's the ever-present absent. Um, but uh, she made plenty of money, but so did uh, Mayot Almabi, okay, to, to foreground another person. And she played to stereotypes, and she, you know, that begin is commercially successful, but also represents the soul of the Antilles. The Antilles. So... The commercialization of the colonial opens up some opportunities, even as it is completely stereotyping. And I just think we just have to live with that and, and understand that the performers lived with that too. And that they, there were many savvy people who played both sides of that. Um, and actually, uh, in chapter four, I do mention that I talk about these fundraising balls. Right. And at one point, you know, Nancy Cunard, and, and thanks to Jennifer, who's done so much for me, but Jennifer Boitin, like, actually handed me a document at one stage, or she emailed it to me, but it, where it's like, oh, yeah, Nancy Cunard is going to play for the jazz musicians to pay, a play at your anti colonial ball, so you'll attract more people. And then Masali Hajj can give his speech. And then everybody will learn about anti-colonialism. So I think there is a very complex, sometimes mutually satisfactory relationship between commercialism, music, and colonialism weaves through it and is sometimes put in service of the revolution. Um, that's the best answer I can really think to give. Sounds great. Um. Uh, just a quick reminder to every listener, and thank you so much, um, but you can put questions in the chat if you haven't already, just send them to Jonathan. Um, and in the interim, I will jump in with a slightly secretly personal question, but hopefully a relevant one. So obviously as a Brit, I was particularly intrigued by some of the comments you made, or uh, not comments you made, but references that you made to uh, Paul Robeson mentioning that he preferred London to Paris uh, because he felt like he was less on display. And you, and you also discussed um, Somebody who said that they went to a, I forget who it was, but they were a lover of a contest, um, I believe. And they also felt like these relationships with white people were not entirely equal. This kind of adoring French population didn't always see them as humans. They often felt like spectacles, which perhaps explains why they had this like secret second uh, ball after the other one. There were too many people that they're staring at them at. Um, and I just wondered if you could say any more really about the interplay between London and Paris at these times, people moved around. I know in the book you talk about musicians moving around more generally across Europe, but is, do you get a sense of the of people moving between London and Paris in particular? All the time. All the time. And one of the interesting things that I think happens uh, 
that goes along with this mobility is precisely this ability, and I write about it with Black Americans, to compare France and England and America. Because I think in that act of comparison, in the experience of travel, you can make a critique. We always do this. We do this when we travel ourselves. Oh, I experienced this here. I experienced that. Which, when, you know, the Dutch are always on time, but the, you know, whatever. Um, and, but you see these black performers doing it precisely as you said. Now, that Paul Robeson quote, <laughs> it is true. He was talking to the first meeting of the Association of Colored People in London. So I wonder if there's a little bit of crowd pleasing going on, you know, like when, uh, when, um, oh, I don't know, you go to a concert and it opens with, I love you, London, or whatever, you know, I wonder if there's a little bit of that. But, but he wasn't the only one to say it. Um, and, you know, Mark Matera's work uh, is great on London as an anti-colonial metropolis. Uh, so it, it, people were moving around. They were making comparisons. They were also talking to each other about those comparisons, about their dissatisfaction with empire. Um, and, and this wasn't just the musicians. I think the Americans, I have a sense, the Americans tended to move between England and France more than some of the um, black French entertainers. Um, I, I actually, I should check that. That's really interesting. Um, but, but they did move around. They were mobile. And Florence Mills, on the other hand, another black American performer, preferred Paris to London. She found that the, um, although she said Paris is becoming a little American, this is a constant fear of black Americans and black French, actually, that Paris will turn American and overt racism will set in. Um, but yeah, they were moving, they were making comparison. I also think this is part of this fascinating process of musical exchange. They were hearing each other's music and shaping new sounds in, in, through that process and shaping their impressions, as I said, of empire. And to me, it's really interesting that this isn't just happening with the anti-colonial um, activists that we know about. I mean, we know that um, George Padmore is talking to um, uh, um, Lamine Senghor, not Leopold, but Lamine Senghor. And we know they're both talking to Masali Haj at various times, and these networks exist. But yeah, the performers are doing it too and drawing their own conclusions, and I think that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Jonathan, do you want to come back Yes, in? I apologize for disappearing for a moment. Um, so Rachel, I, I have kind of one last question and then I've, I've got a bunch from, from the, uh, the audience that I'd like to get to at some point here shortly. But um, I wondered if you might talk about um, one of the other interesting things I felt that you really uh, developed out of your analysis of these different groups is a sort of fragility of the alliances that they would develop. That it seemed that there were these kind of moments and music could be part of like the constitutive element of these these political and cultural alliances and yet they all they they, they felt that they were uh, quite ephemeral um perhaps also like music right so i wondered if you might be able to talk about that uh, a bit and and maybe that might project a little bit more um as you talk about in your um your conclusion like the what happens next so to speak right yeah and well, on the music side, what happens next? People should read your book. I think we're getting to a stage where we can almost do a national history of France through music. What with your work? Just, yeah, just put them back Rash to back to back, right? Yeah, Rashida Bragg's work. Um, Celeste de Moore has a fast, fantastic Celeste, new book yeah. out, Soundscapes of Liberation. Um, but uh, you are absolutely right about the fragility of these alliances. Um, there's a wonderful phrase, actually, Heather Street Salter, who's based at Northeastern University, has put together an edited collection on anti-colonial networks and the League Against Imperialism, in which they discuss the long-term after effects. And they say, look, even though the League Against Imperialism collapsed, 
it had it was set up people had these exchanges they had these moments of solidarity they were reacting to these same events in the same moment and and I was about to say emailing each other about it, but like <laughs> writing to each other. <laughs> On writing. a Zoom call with each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Communicating with each other about it. And there were those, uh, there was that circulation of ideas that, and nothing could go back to the way it was before. And I think that's also so important to remember that, okay, yeah, the, uh, um, uh, Ligue de la race negre, split up from the Union des Travailleurs Negres, split up from this other section. But they knew who each other was. They knew what the work was that they were doing. And yes, they did come together at the Bal de la Glacière, or indeed, um, I'd write about the concert for uh, fundraising for Ethiopia. Right. Um, where you have the, the French Caribbeans uh, women collecting money while a choir featuring performers from Senegal uh, performs, and they're actually performing with uh, white French people in that choir as well. And so, although fragile, I think those alliances set up connections and a rhetoric and a circulation of ideas that lasted well beyond them. And honestly, this is still going on to this day. Um, and the thing you didn't ask me about, Jonathan, although we did email about earlier, is where are the North Africans in all of this? Right, right, right. Where are the North Africans? <laughs> where are the North Africans? And maybe it's going to come in the in the um, chat questions, but they are there. Um, and the Haitians. And the ha and the ha yeah you, you, yeah they are there, and they are this awkward presence, right? Because they aren't colonial and they but they come i think leo sajus is haitian and he comes and he talks to um he, he he's in meetings with lamine sangor when they're discussing putting together this fundraising ball but then he sort of disappears again so there are these yeah fluctuating alliances yes yeah, so you want to follow up on that before we move to the questions yeah, I, I, uh, how do you feel about time? I can I can cede my space if you think. No, we've we've got some time. I just thought this was this kind of an interesting thread. Kind of some of the I know you wanted to keep up with. Yeah, I could I, I could go in several directions now, and I'm like, oh, like he's giving me a lead. I'm like, which one is it though? Which one? Um, I'm just gonna go with where I think you might be going. Um, which about music um, and community building is clearly the thread of the whole book, um, and. I kind of wondered, you know, you talk, you, you describe really vividly the gathering, the link between the political and the cultural um, and the politics. Um, and I just wondered if you thought about in the present, were you ever tempted to sort of say, ah, oh, and now it's changed because, or to draw links, or to, for me reading it, it, it certainly provokes a lot of questions about it. It's, it was about how people make community. Um, did, were you tempted to write about the place of hip hop? You mentioned Latin earlier in present day France, where black music sits in contemporary France and how identity is made in contemporary, you know, because it's, it's a very similar situation. Um, I know that you write about the interwar period, so it's not entirely fair as a question, but I was just curious to see, is it something for a future project perhaps? It's a great question. And uh, <laughs> my students <laughs> talk to me all the time when I talk a little bit about music and racialization in France, they're like hip hop. And it's an, a budding field and there's some really good work being done by Karim Hamou and Paroma Goes. And I do, I am now supervising graduate work on it, which I'm really excited and happy about. And actually through that graduate work on Dutch hip hop, because this is really fascinating to me now also to see some resonances. Now I'm living here in the Netherlands with some of the things I write about in France, um, and also, of course, some local specificity and differences. But Ikezua, it, you look at music today, and there are some of the same things going on. And there is about to be a conference just this coming week, actually, in Paris. It's online. It's open to, to people. Um, Emily Schumann uh, is helping to organize it uh, about 
pantheon, cultural legitimacy and French hip hop. What does this do? And it's the idea that institutionalizing hip hop, uh, which has been a voice of black expression in France, um, black diasporic expression, but more than that too, because it's never just been black diasporic music. It, 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 what happens when it does get institutionalized, commercially successful? <laughs> um, what happens, it's also really interesting to see how it's criminalized at times, how it's represented, things have, uh, how actually the conscious rap uh, of the 1990s is now much more consumerist, um, overtly bling bling rap and all of this is fascinating and um, so yes I'm sort of working on it now but because I don't feel actually though I do music I, hip hop is like next level right like the the denseness of the lyrics the the sound world that it comes out of and actually also the being in the clubs because it's present day and I know I haven't been in those clubs like uh I feel more comfortable supervising and sort of following it at the moment at that slight degree of distance. And maybe that's also a product of the last 10 years of feeling that experiential knowledge counts. When you're writing histories of race and racialization and, and wondering if I would write the same book now that I did um, start on <laughs> in my PhD, I don't know. I, I mean, sharing, I, I, I think that's a, a, a very honest and vulnerable position that, you know, we have to acknowledge as scholars of, of, of you know, music that has been so othered, you know. Um, guess what? Do you want to follow up on anything there? Um, no. I, so I think we'll, a little we'll bit. stop some time at the end if, if we think of some things we want to wrap up with. No pun intended. I just, I just know that I, I actually want to say one thing. I just know that after the hour, we do start to lose people. So I will stay the whole time. But um, I understand if people are, uh, sort of have family commitments. I, I really want to thank everybody. for coming. I feel so supported and lifted up. Um, but I also wanted to take a moment to call attention to something in the book that Kessawa uh, alerted me to in a conference paper that she gave. And... She said to me, you know, people didn't come to Paris to be formed in Paris and suddenly awoken to these anti-colonial ideas or have their musicianship perfected in Paris. She said they were doing this work in the Caribbean and they brought it with them to Paris. And that actually was a really transformational moment for me. And it's in the book, I forget which page. And so I want to thank you for that as well. I'm sad. I'm not sad, emotional. But you remember that conversation. I remember it really well as well. Because I remember your face. You were like, <gasps> <laughs> so I would like to, I, I've got a few questions here that I think are, uh, are quite interesting. And I think they, uh, they run the gamut and talk about a lot of things that, uh, that your book touches on that also touch on perhaps some contemporary things. So um, the first question uh, comes from uh, Kate Keller, who, by the way, uh, thanks for being here. And she has a lot of uh, knowledge and experience about uh, the sort of colonial, the gaze uh, on the colonial subjects. Uh, so she wanted to thank you, of course, for bringing your expertise of music into this field. Um, and she asked, um, how much of the music discussed in the book were you able to hear through recording? Uh, and how much was only described in the sources? And did that affect your analysis of it uh, in the text? Thank you. That is like just a heavenly question. Yes. I love that question. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it, it's, it's everything. Um, it, I wasn't able to hear all of the music, all of the music that I wrote about and, and kind of each chapter I do try and deal with a piece of music. And in the, the, the one that was missing was the Colonial Exposition. And then Gallica actually digitized a, some of the Madagascan music toward the end of the book process. So I was able to listen to it. Um, I listened to a lot of Big E music. I, I spent hours uh, at the BNF, in the radio section of Tolbiac. Also, uh, not at Richelieu, actually, I spent hours looking at sheet music there. Um, and I do read music, so I was able to take digital copies and, and bring it home and play it or sing it and so get a little bit of it in my ears. But 
I couldn't listen to everything, but I tried to listen to as much as I could. So I had a sense of the sound world. And actually, you know, when I first started dissertation, I probably could not have distinguished jazz from the beginning. And so that was really important to me, not just to be able to do that myself through listening, 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 but also to try and explain it to readers in maybe accessible ways so that at least they got a sense of the stakes, of the arguments that the people in the book were having or the discussions. Um, yeah, so much of it I have listened to, not all. And I want to make a Spotify list so you can listen to it. I um, will jump in here and say um, you evoked it so much that I, so I fell in love with the music begin with, um, the, I don't know if people know the Guy Delorier film called La Begin, I think it's called, uh, from like 2005. Um, and it's set in Martinique before the, the um, eruption. And just reading the words, it just absolutely brought it all back. I could hear it, the clarinet, the dance and the joy of the music. And so if people are not familiar with Begin, I would highly recommend uh, that film, if you can get hold of it. But you're all French just um, so I do want to uh, note that we are running a little over, um, and I hope that everybody will stay with us. I, I have two more questions here from the audience that I think are both terrific questions that that um, I would love to hear the answers to myself. So uh, the first one is about um, this difference between political positions of the staunchly anti-colonial Africans versus Antillians wanting recognition for Frenchness, right? So. Um, and I think you talk about this very complex um, relationship the Antillians have to uh, their identity as French subjects, French citizens kind of thing. Um, so was there a tendency of African-Americans to identify uh, with one or the other, the, the, the sort of um, this other group that, that is in this orbit? No, they okay. are having a good time up in Montmartre. And very few of them, um, so, well, okay, I, that is a little bit dismissive. It is not always easy to trace in the sources. Uh, and it's also not easy to trace because the police aren't as worried about the black American musicians. So some of the best records for how these people are talking to each other are in the police records. And, um, there is not that much evidence of black Americans going along to anti-colonial meetings, uh, identifying with anti-colonial rhetoric. Uh, there is some evidence, and so I listened to the, the transcripts uh, down at Emory University. <laughs> University. Uh, there's plenty of evidence of black Americans just having a great time and making lots of money and jamming after the elite white clients have left brick tops, they are there jamming from three in the morning till five in the morning. And I don't think as many of them were alert to the anti-colonial French struggle as we might hope or think. And that's just a true thing too, you know? <laughs> and also that there was the language difference uh, as well. It was more likely that um, County Cullen or uh, indeed Langston Hughes, and we know Claude McKay knows about this because he writes banjo and, and he is very astute about these differences and about colonial subjecthood as well as citizenship. And so yes, Claude McKay, yes, County Cullen a little bit, Alain Locke and Rene Moran are writing to each other uh, constantly and the Nardal sisters are part of that correspondence um, as Brent Hayes Edwards shows. But in terms of did the black Americans pick the more radical kick the French out or the more middle class, maybe please recognize us within the French Republic. Um, no, they, no. Um, there were some class affiliations, like I said, Alain Locke was on, on par with the Nadal sisters and the way that Langston Hughes and Alain Locke use music in some ways, Langston Hughes, you could put actually more with the anti-colonials, uh, you know, um, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, that, and he indeed writes a poem about Ethiopia, but he also writes the mountaintop, the, his, his great poem about like, don't stifle me, don't 
stifle my creative, expressive um, volcanicness. Um, yeah. So, but they're not that involved, to be honest. Okay. Um, and so this last question, and uh, it seems like a logical place to end, and it's about the um, sort of specter that haunts this book, which is uh, the specter of Josephine Baker. So um, the question here involves the recent uh, pantheonization of uh, Baker and um, speaks to the official commentary on France Couture, uh, which recognized her professional artistry and her training performances Reflections on her stage work. Um, so uh, the question here suggests another binary that perhaps this speaks to uh, between the amateur and the marginal uh, on the one hand and the professional and the mainstream on the other hand, right? So, uh, which I think in music, we we might talk about a little bit more towards the end of the 20th century. But I think this is a place maybe that discussion could begin. Um, so, um, I wonder if you could share your thinking about this opposition, uh, the, the, the putative opposition to honor her at the special moment of France's effort to appropriate her art, right? To essentially recognize uh, and sanctify, if you will, uh, Baker's artistry. Yeah, uh, read Man Fat and Young on this in the Washington Post and, and Read Annette Joseph Gabriel, I think, in the LA Review of Books on this, and and read um, uh, who else goes in there? Rokaya Diallo uh, in uh, various places. Uh, French journalist, I can put her name for those who don't know it in the chat. And actually, I wrote a little bit uh, thing for the Washington Post as well in their um, op-ed on history section. Um, I don't. There are two different questions in there, the, the mm -hmm. amateur <laughs> versus professional stuff. And yes, uh, Baker was much more commercially successful. And maybe that's part of what the Nardals are relating to as well, is that the community stuff is less commercial and more authentic and then builds community in this more um, yeah, uh, organic way. Uh, but I it's talked way. to you about mm -hmm. being suspicious of those binaries. Mm -hmm. But then when Josephine Baker, through, it, 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 but sh, it, when she performs what Tyler Stovall himself, I think, called a series of colonial fantasy skits <laughs> in 1931 in Paris, qui remue, and her reputation is made, and she, some newspaper proclaims her queen of the colony, which is like this hilariously paradoxical thing, this, except it's not. Because it is so much easier for the French to say that this black American is a, the truest expression of, of Frenchness and a true delivery of their progressive values because she chose to be French. And she said, Paris is, France is a fairyland for me. France is colorblind. And mm. uh, so that's pretty much what I think about Josephine Baker. And she did make a lot of money and she did commercialize these exotic primitive stereotypes. At the same time, if you look closely, she parodies them. She, she does try and put in place her rainbow tribe, which is this sort of ideological commitment to cosmopolitan humanism. She does show up at the March on Washington and always with Baker, there is this um, tension between Baker's narrative of being Baker and luminous and sucking all the bandwidth and, uh, and her genuine commitment to things that she thinks is good. So, so I just think that Baker, you cannot get away with, from her. She is the specter, you know, and the pantheonization just encapsulates all of this. Uh, and there's great stuff. As I said, Man Fatou Nyan, Rokaya Diallo, Annette Joseph Gabriel, all of them are writing about this. Um, I just saw, and I just, I'm going to say thanks. I don't, if Brett Berliner, if I didn't mention you before, I meant to, because ambivalent desire was also really like something that I came back to when I was writing the book again and again. And Joelle Neulander, of course, whose work on radio uh, is is brilliant, and and so I'm just seeing these names that I think are so amazing in the in the guest list here. 
So uh, with that, I believe we've come beyond end of time here. We've got a little extra, in fact. So I appreciate everybody uh, staying on for um, what I felt was a, a very illuminating and lively conversation about a wonderful book that I encourage everyone to seek out. So thank you all. Again, uh, don't forget, I'm sure that Sally and Judith would be remiss if I didn't remind uh, about the upcoming Society um, Conference uh, and additional French Press um, uh, events coming up. So please uh, keep an eye out for those. And, and thank you so that. much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Rachel. I appreciate your, your answers uh, and sharing your expertise and thoughts. Thank you so much. I just, it was a blast. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Kesawa. Awesome. And we'll do it over drinks next time. <laughs> we'll Absolutely. look forward to it. You were all wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a great session. Thanks for having us. Thank we you. Really it was yeah, our thank pleasure. Thank you so much. It was now, our Rachel, pleasure. Rachel, I had a question for you. Um, yeah. If you have a minute. <laughs> hey, I am here. Yeah, I, no, I, I know it's late for you. I, I actually, no, I know it's, it's more people are, are direct messaging me and I can't keep up with them. And, oh. and but, but <laughs> I'm glad of them all. So, yeah, yeah. Do I'm here. To, uh, do you want to respond to them first? I can't. They've all left. Okay. Yeah. They say nice things to them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just, I just had a, 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 a thought because, you know, I just, I just um, wrote a book on a French Jewish poet and, so many of the themes that you talked about were exact, and you know, he wrote most of his work in the 1920s. He's, he wasn't, uh, he was born in Geneva, and, but became a French nationalized citizen after the First World War. He, he volunteered to fight. But what was striking to me is the tension between his, um, the ways in which he articulated his Jewishness. And I also play with these words, right? Judaism, yeah. Jewishness, because yeah. they're not the same. Um, and his Frenchness and the ways that those, um, those multiple attachments is how I call it, but the sort of multiplicity of affiliations and attachments were possible for uh, Jews in the 1920s and became less possible, of course, in the 30s. But it was just striking to me um, the language, the tensions, the, the themes that you brought up in the beginning were so similar <laughs> to what mm. I was writing about in the 20s um, in terms of, I mean, for me, it's about minority subcultures, which is the way I kind of framed it. But anyway, it's just like something about the 1920s, um, too, I think that in France, in this post-war, before the really before the 30s or between the, before the mid-30s, that there is this, it's a very... It's an expansive moment in lots of ways. So yeah, no, and I I couldn't agree more. I think that's absolutely. It, but you know, it goes back. I teach a lot about the French Revolution and universalism, and and there's this moment where uh, what do they say in the National Assembly? We will deny everything to the Jews as a nation and give everything to them as as a community. It's in Lynn Hunt's book, and and it's just and I unpack that with students all the time to try and talk about the, the just the, the resistance of the national myth towards these, what I sometimes call braided identities, right? We, we all have mm -hmm. like a hair braid where you can see the strands distinctly, but they come together to form this yeah. lovely whole. And yeah, and I think that's I mean, true for Jewishness as well. Yeah, I don't think you can talk about French culture that's somehow separate from either black culture or Afro-French culture or Jewish culture, right? Yeah. I mean, they are, it's in the same way you can't talk about American culture without talking yeah. about African American culture. I mean, it doesn't exist, you know? Yeah. You can't, certainly can't talk about it. There is no anymore. American culture. Yeah, exactly. there is something called that. <laughs> anyway, it was, it was a wonderful talk, and thank you. I'm sorry I was being a little bit of a, an annoyance. Thank you so much, guys. I, no, yeah, I'm so sorry. sorry. We went, I, for some reason, I thought we had until 3.15, so my apologies on that she, she was pretty clear about the hour and then take the, the uh chat but i'm i you know i love talking so no but thanks i am so no, excited i feel incandescent with gratitude so thank you <laughs> and thank you for having me i am like the least qualified person on this panel and i'm so pleased that like you let me come in especially because rachel and i actually met first at one of your conferences in leeds 
how yeah. many years ago i'm not sure um yeah. see people they put us in touch oh, it was it was in aix en provence it was the french Sorry, colonial it was right. at aix en provence but it was see people he was like oh you guys should talk to each other um and yeah. and it's been a great like ride so thank you so much yeah for and and Jonathan and I sang. And was it no, we New went Brunswick? out dancing in New Orleans. Dancing in New Orleans. Oh, um, wait, yeah. And <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I can't. But, I, yeah. But it's been part of that, we, it's it's been a, a we've known each other quite a long time. But so thanks everybody. And I am now finally. It is twenty past it's ten here. Yes. Yeah. Actually, vin vin rouge, a petit uh, verre de vin <laughs> rouge, and then bed. <laughs> Hey, everybody, it was really nice to meet you. Bye, uh, everybody. Bye. Bye.